from Washington, D.C. Um, <clears throat> my name is uh, Dr. Anwar Bukhars, uh, and I'm a professor of counterterrorism and counter and violent extremism at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. I want to extend a very warm welcome to the many Africa Center alumni, distinguished colleagues, and friends uh, who have joined us today for this webinar on innovations and challenges countering violent extremism in Africa. Uh, we're pleased to partner with the African Center for the Study and Research on Terrorism, CAIR, for this event. Uh, and today's session will be moderated by Idris Ralali, the acting director of, of CAIR. But before I turn it over to Idris, the moderator, uh, let me say a few words about us, um, the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Um, the Africa Center serves as a forum for research, uh, academic programs, and the exchange of ideas with the aim of enhancing citizen security by strengthening the effectiveness and accountability of African uh, institutions. We are a U.S. Department of Defense uh, academic regional center located at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. And we carry out uh, our mission of advancing African security by uh, expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing um, strategic solutions. So accordingly, we seek to generate relevant insight and analysis that informs practitioners and policymakers on topical and emerging security trends and on effective responses to dynamics and complex security challenges. So recognizing that addressing serious challenges can can only come about through candid and thoughtful exchanges, um, the Africa Center provides opportunities for partners to exchange views on shared interests and sound practices. By engaging with our African partners, military and civilian, governmental and civil society, as well as national and regional, we hope to reinforce that all have valuable roles to play in mitigating the complex drivers of conflict and insecurity on the continent today through enduring and capable institutions. So this kind of dialogue infused with real world experiences, fresh analysis, we hope provides an opportunity you know, for continued learning, catalyzes concrete actions. So thank you again for joining us today for this conversation uh, on the most promising practices and known pitfalls in preventing and countering violent extremism and terrorism. And now I'll turn it over to our distinguished uh, moderator for today's session, Idris Lalali, the acting director of CAIR. Idris. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Anwar. Uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to, to be jointly organizing this event with, uh, with ACSS. We're really privileged uh, for this relationship and, and partnership that started since 2005, and it's getting stronger and stronger, and uh, there is a, a lot of uh, exchanges between our two institutions, and we're very grateful for that. Um, indeed, today's session is, is, is quite interesting, but before that, let me just, uh, you know, say something about CAIRT. Um, it, it goes without saying that, um, you know, I have to identify and define what CAIRT stands for. It's the African Center for the Study and uh, Research on Terrorism. Uh, we are a structure of the African Union Commission established to assist member states in developing their counterterrorism capacity and also in implementing their international um, obligations in relation to the prevention and combating of terrorism and violent extremism. And we're short of 17 years old of existence. So we're past our teenage years. I think we're getting into adulthood and we had to, to become adult quite, quite quickly. The, um, the, the threat was dictating the, the, the level and the rate of, uh, of, uh, 
of progress that we had to make as a continent and we've grown uh, to, to become recognized as the African Union technical arm in, in relation to CT and, and PCVE. Uh, indeed, it's, uh, it's a pleasure today to, uh, to be part of this, uh, of this webinar, uh, which I'm sure will, uh, will, will create a, a very good discussion. Uh, the goal of the webinar is to explore new insights into the strategies and innovative program adopted by uh, both states and non-state actors. And we're privileged to, to be looking at three very important member states that have a lot of experience, uh, Mauritania, Nigeria, and Kenya. Uh, it's important also to recall the objectives that were uh, set, um, you know, as, as, as we were uh, preparing the, the concept note. Uh, uh, the, the objectives are to become familiar with some of the lessons learned uh, from existing counter violent extremism intervention on the continent, uh, to have a greater understanding of the most promising locally informed P, CVE prevention and countering violent extremism and, and CT counterterrorism insights, experiences and lessons learned as well as known pitfalls in preventing and countering violent extremism. And finally, is to appreciate the relevance and the value of, role, uh, uh, of the role of resilience and dialogue in informing evolving national action plans and regional strategies on, on the continent. So you, 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 you will understand from the objective that we have set ourselves that it's going to be much more pro um, uh, concrete in a sense that it is much more realistic and it touches uh, some experiences that have proven uh, to be very successful on the ground. But also what's important is to, to identify and define and understand the pitfalls that they, uh, they, 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 uh, they faced and how these pitfalls were overcome. And this is all part of sharing experiences and lessons learned, whether they're good or not. But the takeaway is to get a better understanding, pragmatic and uh, uh, action uh, uh, approached um, process in relation to uh, PV. So today we have three very valuable and capable personalities and panelists uh, that will share with us their own perspective and experiences on the topic. We have uh, my dear friend, Dr. Anwar uh, Bukhars. Uh, as he introduced himself, he's a professor of counterterrorism and countering violent extremism at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. And he's my partner in crime in all these programs, I must say. So he's, uh, he's someone who's pulling all these programs together and I have to salute you for that, Anwar. Uh, prior to joining the Africa Center, Dr. Bukhars was a non-resident fellow in the Middle East program at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and an associate professor of international relations at uh, McDaniel, McDaniel, I hope I pronounced it correctly, uh, college. He has served on several advisory boards and committees on the Sahel and North Africa, uh, including at the African Peace Building Network at the Social Science Research Council. His research has been published, published in numerous leading policy uh, publications and academic journals. I must say I was uh, and, and, and still uh, I am a fan of, of the publications of Dr. Onwar. So whenever he publishes something, I'll be digesting it quickly. Uh, Mr. Uh, we have Mrs. Romy uh, Sigsworth. I hope I pronounced it correctly. I do apologize, Romy, if I did not. Uh, she is a research consultant with the Complex Threats in Africa and INACT program at the Institute for Security Studies, uh, also known as ISS. Prior to this, she was the gender specialist at the ISS and senior researcher in the gender-based violence program at the Center for the Study of Violence and Reconciliation. Uh, she has also been the editor of the academic journals, African Security Review, Bioethics and Developing World Bioethics. She has an MST uh, in Women's Studies from the University of uh, Oxford. And finally, we have Dr. Akinelo, Olojo, he is a senior researcher at the Lac Chad Basin program in Dakar. He joined the ISS uh, in 2018 as a senior researcher uh, in the Complex Threats in Africa program in Pretoria. Before this, he was a visiting scholar at the, at the now I have to switch to my French accent, Institut d'études politiques de Sciences Po, Sciences Politiques uh, in, in France where he thought on violence and um, terrorism in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Dr. Akinola was also a visiting research fellow at the International Center for Counterterrorism, ICCT, uh, in The Hague. He has a PhD from uh, l'Université Paris-Descartes, voilà. Alors, uh, Dr. 
Bukharz. So Anwar, my dear friend, without a further ado, because I know we're very short on time and we would like to allow space for discussions and exchanges between us and the, and the participants. Let me start with you. Um, you know, I'm, I start with North Africa because I'm North African, then we'll move to the other parts of the continent. So this is much closer to home. Um, what are the factors that have uh, enabled Mauritania to push back against terrorism and violent extremism? And now we're looking at the Mauritanian uh, experience. So over to you, Anwar. Thank you, Idris. Um, it's an excellent question. I mean, the story of, of Mauritania's transformation, uh, you know, from the weakest link in a crisis ridden neighborhood to its most resilient in managing uh, exposure to terrorism, I think it's, it's quite uh, instructive. I mean, the country, as, as you know, and as we all know, was, was the first um, in the Sahel to be hit by terrorist attacks in 2005. But since 2011, it has escaped. Uh, the diffusion of, of terrorism. And this is no small feat for a country long bedeviled by fragile politics, you know, by military factionalism uh, and ethno-racial tension. So, you know, it, observers of Mauritania, they have puzzled for quite some time over this paradox, right? I mean, and, and some attribute the Mauritanian exception to an alleged non-aggression pact with uh, with Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb and, and other violent extremists. But this, this narrative, as, as one key observer of, of the country has noted, you know, provides an insufficient explanation as to why a, uh, a weak country, fragile country such as Mauritania, has been able to break the violent uh, extremist cycle. Uh, and I believe that Mauritania's security reforms, including training, you know, enhanced mobility, special forces, proven uh, procurement and community engagement have strengthened its capability to confront uh, 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 violent extremist groups. So let's start with, with the first factor, which is the attempt to overhaul the military <clears throat> that started uh, you know, after 2009. So what happened is it taken advantage of a favorable economic environment that was marked by a mining boom. Former president with Abnazis, who seized power, as we know, in 2008 in a military coup, and his partner, defense minister and current president, uh, Mohammed Nazwani, you know, uh, after suffering a series of terrorist attacks, they decided to launch significant uh, military reforms. And the military overhaul began with, you know, symbolic and substantive actions to boost the war fighting infrastructure and quality of life of soldiers. So the first symbolic response that were taken, uh, they were meant to address, you know, first the hollow infrastructure and the low morale through restoration of soldiers barracks, through provision of new uniforms, through across the board pay and compensation raises for military personnel. Substantively, the process of modernization of the army became to materialize, you know, with better military training, uh, better procurement of new armaments and material, the creation of special forces uh, capabilities. But in all of this, you know, it was, I believe, the choice of, of priorities, right, which was, which was critical. Choice of priorities in in, in military acquisition and procurement activities that proved significant. Uh, for example, instead of opting for excessively expensive military hardware that the Mauritania could hardly afford anyway, you know, the, the Mauritania government smartly, I think, favored structural reforms and the acquisition of equipment that was appropriate to their needs. And there are several examples, you know, to boost its air power capabilities, for example, Mauritania settled for the Brazilian Super Tucano light military planes. I mean, these planes were uh, not expensive. They were designed to fly in high temperature and humidity conditions in rugged terrain, such as the Mauritanian desert. For land forces, right, I mean, they were outfitted with modern pickup trucks, with global positioning equipment. The government also invested in professional military education, which was stagnant by right, up to 2009, and it was not fit for purpose. And this brings me to the second point, which is, you know, how Mauritanian forces adapted to the battlefield. Because all these endeavors that I talked about had to be supplemented by a rethinking of doctrine and operations. The success in, in counterterrorism 
requires the transformation. And in this case, Mauritania required the transformation of the Mauritanian military force that was too slow, that was unwieldy, and that was wedded <clears throat> to outmoded tactics. I mean, when you look at the before 2010, the classic organization of the units were ill-suited to tackle the threat. And the threat here is that you have these bunch of violent extremist groups that were smaller, that were more nimble, right? And they were roaming the Mauritanian desert. So Mauritania embarked on <clears throat> the creation of the special intervention groups, special forces, about eight small unit teams that were designed to be versatile in thinking and, ex and execution. And to strengthen and maintain group cohesion and motivation of these units, members of the unit teams, for example, had to serve together for several years. Importantly, these combat teams had been well equipped <clears throat> with vehicles, with machinery, as well as with supplies, especially fuel, water, and ammunition. Because the goal here was that you know, these units must be able to sustain independent counterterrorism operations in the desert you know, for a number of days. Intelligence also played an important role in, in, in counterterrorism operations. And here, you know, uh, after 2009, efforts were directed towards developing both field level human intelligence networks and technical capabilities. And this ranged from the acquisition you know, of modern surveillance radars to the effective revitalization of the most rudimentary uh, uh, existing capabilities and assets. <clears throat> such as the Mauritanian military nomad group. Uh, for Mauritanian officials, <clears throat> you know, the GN, the Mauritanian the military nomad group, provides two benefits. Uh, uh, and this would be my last point here. By fusing intelligence gathering activities with infrastructure development. Because the GN, the nomad group, it's helped in terms of sanitation. It helped in terms of education. So. In other words, the GN, the, uh, the nomad group, you know, was or is improving the living conditions of populations to build the loyalty to the government, which in turn, you know, pays dividends in terms of intelligence collection regarding suspicious movements of armed groups, trafficking groups, et cetera. So this strategy of community engagement in remote areas of the desert, uh, I think has been a critical component of the counterterrorism uh, approach adopted by the, by the Mauritanian government. Over. Thank, thank you, Anwar. I, let me follow up with, uh, with, with a complimentary question since you're touching on the community resilience. In the, in the Mauritanian counterterrorism case study uh, you authored, you also highlighted a soft approach to counterterrorism. Uh, can you discuss this, you know, some of, those, uh, some of the, those measures? I think community resilience is one of them, the investment in infrastructure and so on. So please, if, if you can elaborate more, that could be very helpful. Over to you, Anwar. Sure. As I said, you know, community <clears throat> engagement was was an important pillar in this uh, uh, in this multi-dimensional uh, counterterrorism <clears throat> approach uh, and and counter-environment extremism approach. So to for, to improve security and public service delivery, the government, for example, uh, you know, established uh, or built these new cities in in remote rural areas that were vulnerable to the <clears throat> infiltration of the extremist groups. And the goal here was to try to concentrate these sparse and dispersed rural populations into larger settlements. Uh, so again, the goal was to create these focal sites, right? Uh, uh, and defensible positions in the immediate vicinity, especially of the Malian border, in vulnerable areas where settlements of, of people already existed. The policy has been to improve you know, the <clears throat> security and living conditions of the population to keep them, to engage, you know, the communities uh, and to make them stakeholders, you know, in some of these, <clears throat> in some of these uh, projects. So, and this is the, the strategy that the Mauritanians uh, describe as winning the hearts and, and minds of the locals 
you know, in the remote areas of the desert. And as I said, it has been a critical component of the CT, the counterterrorism approach adopted by the Mauritanian regime. In parallel to these efforts at, you know, reinforcing the state's coercive capacity, reinforcing its <clears throat> developmental strategy, its community strategy, the policy of engagement with extremist actors was also pursued. Uh, today, the idea of uh, uh, of dialoguing with violent extremist groups, as we know, is gaining credence in some Sahelian countries. But in the Mauritania, I mean, the regime has pursued a dual strategy of what I described before, trying to bolster its deterrence, its defense posture, while remaining open to dialogue <clears throat> with extremists. And it's the second part of the strategy that fuels or has fueled suspicions that the regime has concluded. Uh, a mutual non-aggression pact with, with violent extremist groups. Uh, his proponents of this thesis, they point to, you know, to several <clears throat> events, the 2011, for example, documents that were confiscated at the time of some of the Ladin's death, and that made reference at attempts of uh, rapprochement between the Mauritanian government and Qaeda in 2010. You know, they also highlight uh, uh, examples like in 2015 when the Mauritanian government released Senda with the Bumama, former spokesman of Qaeda named Dan Sardim. Uh, this guy had been detained and he was under an international uh, arrest warrant, <clears throat> as well as the curious 2015 decision of the so called Islamic State to not include Mauritania in the West Africa Wilaya province. So, you know, uh, all, all of this fuels this, 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 this speculation. Uh, Mauritania has also resisted participating in MINUSMA, the United Nations multidimensional uh, integrated stabilization mission, right? Despite the fact that its blue helmet forces are deployed in, in CAR. So some, <clears throat> some observers, they, they assert that one of the ingredients of the countries, and again, it's one uh, among many of the ingredients of the country's hitherto se uh, security successes could be attributed to the maintenance of these channels of communication and, and contacts with, with armed groups. And Mauritania, as we know, has used, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, clerics and, and, uh, and, and, and others in, 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 this, uh, in, this, in this strategy. Uh, you know, others argue that this is short-sighted. And it undermines regional efforts to tackle transnational violent extremist groups. Uh, so, as a member of the G5 Sahel Alliance, the country's pledges, for example, of goodwill are sometimes questioned, right, by its partners, which, as, as you know, which fault the Rakshaw for not fulfilling its commitment to provide a battalion. But for the Mauritanians, I mean, they, they justify, you know, this this posture as <clears throat> as defensive uh, and as uh, and as, and as necessary, and in any case, they say that, that other countries, you know, they have adopted the same strategy and methodology with, uh, with, with some success. So I'll, I'll stop here. Okay, this is, this is seriously interesting. I wish we had more time, uh, Anwar. Let me just jump into the challenges. What are the remaining challenges of, of CT and CV in the country? And I think you've touched a bit on them now, but uh, if you can give us some, you know, uh, clear ones that we need to, you know, Mauritania needs to focus on, or we will see as being a challenge. Sure. Again, as I said, the turnaround in the security situation in, in Mauritania, this is the, you know, the good story without romanticizing it, obviously. It reveals that uh, and that's why we're having this case study reveals that fragile states are not beyond redemption. I mean, for, for as I said earlier, for much of the 2000s, Mauritania was a beleaguered state, right? It was faltering politically, economically, <laughs> militarily. But in the 2000s, the country moved from being on the cusp of being overwhelmed by violent extremist groups to, to actually managing or throwing off the grip of, 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 this, of this threat. So there have been notable improvements, you know, in intelligence collection, border infrastructure, the assertion of the state's administrative and security presence in areas long considered remote and inaccessible 
the engagement of communities, obviously, not just in, for intelligence purposes, but just to try to, to regain or gain the trust <clears throat> of these populations. And this is in marked contrast, right, to its Sahali neighbors, where, where, where military coups, like if you take Mali in 2012, or attempted coups like in Burkina Faso 2015, I mean, these coups, they deepened rifts in the armed forces. They weakened their ability to confront violent extremist groups. The Mauritanian security services, however, after 2008, the coup, they were effectively reorganized and the armed forces became better equipped, trained and paid. So, and these notable gains have been acknowledged even by the government's domestic critics. That said, Mauritanian success does not mean, as, as you know, it's out of the woods yet. Uh, the country still faces uh, well, it still suffers from many critical vulnerabilities, uh, uh, namely an uneven distribution of wealth, uh, an inequitable and unfair distribution of public resources, uh, social polarization and resentment over racial and ethnic representation in the political and bureaucratic apparatuses of the state remain acute, um, and even within the military, where earnest efforts have been made to upgrade the well-being of the personnel, the military is still riven uh, by, uh, by, by, by tribal divisions and ethnic and racial disequilibrium, especially at the officer corps level. So <clears throat> for the Mauritanian military to pursue its force modernization, and reach its full potential. It's a long way to go, obviously. It needs to tackle these, these, these to resolve these structural problems by further improving on military cohesion, governance, management of human and financial resources. The security gains are fragile <clears throat> and reversible. And to sustain them requires, and this is my last point here, you know, <clears throat> the 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 Government needs to improve its, its political governance, you know, its economic governance, uh, and its security, I mean, governance. Uh, so it was good to, to try to make, you know, communities in peripheral areas uh, and regions uh, uh, resilient, because that, that's critical here. Uh, but more efforts need to be done, more efforts to improve. Uh, improve governance, whether it's political, economic, and security, as well as to upgrade regional cooperation, because as you know, this is a transnational, right? I mean, no country can 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 tackle the, the job the job by itself. So I'll, I'll stop here in case. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anwar. Indeed, uh, these challenges are not specific to Mauritania only. I'm sure most of the African member states are facing the same challenges. And uh, uh, you know, these challenges are even greater, uh, you know, given the uh, pressure on the security apparatus, as you were saying, they had to reshift the doctrine, uh, go through this transformation, despite, you know, the various coup d'etats that happens between 2005 up, uh, up until now. So I think, yes, there are a multitude of challenges. It's interesting also the non-aggression pact, and it is something that we read about and, and heard about. And it would be good maybe that uh, some of our colleagues that are coming from Mauritania, and I see on my list, there are very many of them that can comment on the non-aggression pact, because it's something that, you know, we sometimes, you know, uh, to, to be politically correct, never mention. But I think, you know, uh, looking at the progress of tourism on, in Africa, uh, one has to think outside the box and see what has worked. <laughs> you know, even if there is a non-aggression pact that someone has to speak about it and give us their explanation and um, their, their takeaways, their challenges, their, uh, their, uh, the opportunities that that offered them. To, to gain peace. Uh, however, having an aggression uh, you know, uh, pact means in risk management that basically you're shifting the risk from your country to a neighboring country, for instance. So I don't know, I don't wanna be making any comments on those, but it would be interesting to see and, and hear from those that, um, that, uh, that, that had experienced, uh, you know, uh, or had had some experience in that. You know, I'm hesitating between, uh, between Romy or Akanelo, um, but let me just switch to Akanelo. Uh, you know, uh, I want you to tell us a bit about Boko Haram, 
because what whatever you know what 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 um, Anor was presenting is just closer to to your region than it is to Kenya. So let me just be geographically you know uh, respective of the dynamics that we have in the Sahel and, and West Africa and North Africa and how it's being impacted. So tell me, what are some of the key features of the Boko Haram crisis? You know, also Boko Haram, we read about it, we we saw how it progressed, we lived through it since the days of the Tablighi movement to Muhammad Yusuf to now you know the two fractions of Boko Haram. So tell us, please, um, uh, my brother, what are some of the key features of the Boko Haram crisis? Um, Idris, thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to join everyone here. Um, I think you've made my work very easy. Um, I think some of what I'm going to speak about will actually be common knowledge. So what I'll do is to just run us through five key dimensions of the Boko Haram crisis very quickly, as key reminders for us. And I'm glad Anwar mentioned something about communities, and we'll get to that in a moment. So I'm happy he mentioned something about that. There are five aspects which I'll, I'll just speak on. There is the lethal nature of the crisis uh, with, in regard to Boko Haram. Um, when we speak about the lethal nature, we're talking about it in terms of the fatality records, for example. Uh, we're looking at a situation where in the last decade, in fact, more than a decade, across the four Lake Chad Basin countries, Nigeria, Chad, Cameroon, and Niger, we've seen you know, the media reporting fatality figures in the range of 30,000, 35,000. But personally, I'm, I would argue that it's actually perhaps double that figure uh, because um, uh, we've seen this you know, for more than a decade, like I said. And about 60 to 70,000 for me will probably be that range in terms of the vitality. And that is the equivalent of the capacity of Nigeria's national stadium in Abuja. So we're talking about a crisis that has given the country a stadium of dead people, and that's very serious. Now, the, the lethal aspect of the crisis can also be understood in terms of the phenomenon of suicide attacks. The first suicide attack that uh, the group perpetrated was in 2011, and we've seen hundreds, literally, of this happen. In fact, um, between 2013 and 2018, um, Nigeria or Boko Haram was actually responsible for uh, nearly 80% of female suicide attacks globally. So for five years, the group was consistently responsible for that particular phenomenon. There's the duration. I've mentioned it has lasted for more than 10 years. And within that period, we've seen the group morph into factions. We've seen the group also sustain its rank and file of fighters. We've seen the group sustain an ideology. We've seen the group also demonstrate resilience and even you know, some kind of audacity in its style of attacks. A third aspect of the crisis has to do with the criminal justice component. And this is very key because when we think back to 2009, um, the first leader of, of Boko Haram, Mohammed Yusuf, he was actually killed extrajudicially, as we all recall. And that contributed to an escalation of the crisis. And ever since we've seen how the group has, you know, caused so much, uh, you know, devastation, you know, not only in Nigeria, but, you know, across the region. Um, the criminal justice aspect also has to do with the fact that one of the biggest legal investigations uh, has been witnessed in Nigeria since 2017, and that's the mass terror trials of at least 5,000 terror suspects. And we've seen this happen in phases. The fourth aspect has to do with the transnational character. We're all aware of this. I've mentioned that it's not only a problem for Nigeria, but it's also a regional crisis. And that's why when we speak of the crisis, we always lay emphasis on things like the multinational joint task force, with the key word being multinational, involving countries. And that's why we lay emphasis on the regional aspect, that is the regional um, the strategy for stabilization, recovery and resilience of uh, the Boko Haram affected uh, uh, areas in the Lake Chad Basin. So you see there, there's emphasis on all these terms because it's actually a crisis that is beyond the borders of Nigeria. The final aspect, which I'll, and I'll stop here, is the role of history in the crisis. Now, the role of history is, it's, a, it's an aspect that, in my opinion, I think it hasn't really gotten as much attention. You know, it deserves much more attention than it already has. Um, I say this because when we observe the different phases of the Boko Haram crisis, we see that the group 
has made reference several times to historical narratives in the way the group reinforces its ideology, its propaganda. It makes reference, for instance, to the Sokoto Caliphate, which some of us might be aware of from the 19th century. It was a caliphate that lasted for about 100 years up to around 1904. It makes reference to the Kanembornu Empire. You know, so the group is aware. It's not ignorant of the historical trends. And it's also not ignorant of the global trend. So even when we speak about COVID-19, you know, which obviously has intensified since last year, Boko Haram is aware of this and it's responding to it. In fact, Boko Haram actually has articulated its own kind of uh, you know, a narrative about you know, the pandemic, saying that it's actually some kind of punishment from God and that kind of thing. So this is a group that is aware, it's responding, and it also knows how to exploit history. And the interesting thing is history is also used by the communities, which we'll get to in a moment, the communities that are affected by the crisis to reinforce their own resilience against the group. So I'll stop here with these five aspects and I'll, I'll allow you to, uh, to um, ask for them. Thank you. Very good point. And I think, you know, you've, uh, you've actually pointed to a problem that we don't usually look at the historical aspects of things and how history is exploited by violent extremists and uh, and uh, and terrorists uh, in, in addition to the other ethnic ethnical problem so i think you know as we progress one has to look at historians to come on, uh, into the discussion but also uh, um, uh, you know re, um, uh, now I forgot the word. When I come back, since we're pressed on time, I will tell you exactly who we need to bring on board. But I think, yeah, the makeup of communities, the history behind it is something that countries and governments, when they're drafting their strategies and looking at implementing strategies, they need to really look deep into and see what are the, uh, the, the underlying factors that give rise to extremism and violence. Uh, that is perceived as being a, uh, a problem that is uh, yet to be addressed by, uh, by the authorities. Let me then, um, you know, keep on talking about resilience. I think that issue of resilience is very important point, in particular that you quartered a paper making sense of resilience in Boko Haram crisis. Um, you do provide in, in that paper new insights into how two states, you know, uh, that are the exception, you know, in northern eastern Nigeria, Bo Boshi and Ngombe have managed to resist violent extremism. So can you highlight some of the factors that, uh, that explain how these um, two states were not or less affected by violent extremism compared to the, to the other states up north and the uh, prevalence of the same uh, risk factors that enable groups to flourish in other parts of northern Nigeria. So what makes them so special? What have they done in a way, uh, you know, correctly to avoid them being exploited uh, by extremism and violent uh, terrorism or violent extremism and terrorism, sorry. Well, thank you, Idris. I mean, your question really draws attention to um, the idea of resilience and resilience in a context where most of the time what we hear, what we read, you know, what we research on is usually about the narratives of violence and attacks. But the case which you just mentioned, that is two states in Northeast Nigeria, Bauchi and Gombe states. In the epicenter, you know, the region where there's, you know, it's really the epicenter of the crisis. These are two states which really, you know, made us curious to sort of try and understand why in spite of risk factors, you know, we haven't quite seen them experience the full spectrum of violence caused by Boko Haram. And what we did last year was to actually go to these states. We interviewed over 300 individuals across uh, you know, the society in you know, strata, we spoke to um, traditional institutions and leaders, religious groups, we spoke to women groups, youth groups, and so on, even the, the security agencies. And a number of factors, you know, caught our attention, and I'll just mention three very quickly. The first has to do with the traditional institutions within those states. Um, the traditional institutions are actually not just uh, to be understood in a physical sense, you know, but also to be understood in the sense that they evolve from the historical, uh, you know, origins of the people. They have a depth of legitimacy which the people hold on to. And in the eyes of the communities in those states, there is a kind of acceptance and also legitimacy, like I've mentioned, that they convey. And it's because there is an organic connection between the communities and the history which produced these institutions. So in those two states, for instance, we're talking about 
uh, we actually refer to them as Emirates. Um, you have the Bauchi and the Gombe Emirates, historically speaking. Of course, you have the formal state structure, but then you also have those Emirates systems that operate within the state system. And we see a situation where the traditional leaders actually work very closely with the civil society organizations. They endorse them. They have also worked with the religious institutions. They've worked to some extent with the youth groups and even with the security agencies within the state. So there's a sense of coordination that has happened over the last decade in those two states. And it's really not to say that these states haven't experienced some level of attacks by Boko Haram. They have, but it's the degree to which they have experienced you know, these attacks and what has really um, helped to sort of um, prevent them from, from witnessing you know, more than what others have experienced. The traditional institutions over the last decade also kept an eye on the religious preaching to some extent. You know, we observed that. There was a, some kind of community policing, which they also endorsed. They worked with leaders even at the grassroots, the district heads, the ward heads, the village heads. There was even, you know, they actually active stakeholders in terms of reviewing the evolving security situation within their spheres of influence. And we, we you know, we saw this really come out strongly in, in, you know, in the data we, we, we found. The second thing, which we, um, we observed was the role of religious leaders and the organizations that they lead. Now within Bauchi and Gumbi states in the Northeast of Nigeria, um, we must understand that the struggle against Boko Haram, as Anwar mentioned in what he said earlier, he mentioned something about winning hearts and minds. You know, I heard him when he mentioned that, and it's very key. It's really about winning hearts and minds. It's very paramount. And the involvement of community actors who are familiar with the doctrinal elements that are required to challenge Boko Haram's ideology is absolutely crucial. I, did, I really need to emphasize this. So this explains why, for instance, the Islamic clerics were very active. Um, the organization they lead also played a role. We saw cases where they actually went from one community to another proselytizing and also you know, pushing counter narratives against what Boko Haram was pushing. Um, there were instances where even the first leader of Boko Haram, Mohammed Yusuf, was actually in some of these states I'm mentioning you know, to preach back, back when he was alive. But to some extent, you know, there were some sympathizers, but there was still mass rejection of his ideas. And the Islamic organizations or the clerics who were in those states played an important role in resisting the ideology of Boko Haram. Um, you had sensitization that took place. Um, you had even, for instance, at the level of the youth um, organizations like the Muslim Student Society of Nigeria. You had the National Council of Muslim Youth Organizations that also played a role. And even the Federation of Muslim Women Association of Nigeria, they also were very active in terms of working with the religious organizations in resisting the ideology of Boko Haram. The third factor we, we found interesting um, related to the role of vigilante groups. Now, this is a bit of, um, one has to be very careful when we advocate for vigilante groups to be you know, actively involved in the security framework, um, because of course they must be situated or their involvement must be situated within the rule of law. We've seen cases where some of these uh, self-defense groups within communities have actually abused uh, you know, uh, you know, power or even you know, used violence you know, for, for private or personal uh, objectives. But at the same time, what we saw in these communities was that the, un the, the, the unconventional nature, I'll put it this way, the unconventional nature of this struggle against Boko Haram required the involvement of community-based groups, such as vigilante organizations, because they had the local knowledge of the crisis terrain. Yes, we had, of course, the security agencies, the Nigerian police, you had the military involved, but then we saw a case where even with the police, the vigilante groups were actually working hand in hand with them. And this was very, um, very prominent between 2014 and 2015 when the Boko Haram crisis was really at the height. Um, there were instances where these groups actually helped to identify uh, you know, suspicious movement. There were times when they shared information. They worked closely as well with the, the traditional institutions. Um, the report which we published also mentioned very specific names of vigilante groups 
uh, that were very active in the communities. And there was even an instance in 2012 when the, the state government, that's the Bauchi state government in Nigeria actually endorsed, you know, the establishment of some of these groups and the units which they operated through within communities. So these were the things we saw. And I think the reports we published actually sheds much more light on, on the details, the very specific names and details which we, we found quite relevant. Over Thank you. you. Thank you. Th thank you, Akinola. Um, thank you very much. This is quite valuable. And it leads into a question that I wanted to ask, you know, uh, at the end, what are the lessons learned from the Boshi and Gobo, uh, Gobi sorry, context uh, that would inform evolving national plans and regional strategies? But since we're pressed on time, I think I would summarize them from what you said. The necessity to involve, you know, religious leaders. The necessity to tailor specific the approach to the uh, to the uh, to the communities. To take into account the historical perspective and aspect of these things uh, are quite uh, valuable. The other aspect, yes, historians and anthropologists. As you know, the more I work on these issues, in particular in the Sahel region and West Africa, I think the role of uh, anthropologists is uh, cannot be highlighted enough. And I think, you know, bringing them in the discussion when we're looking at strategies and, and plans of actions would be quite useful and valuable, especially in tailoring you know, the approach and the solutions uh, to the specific context. So I don't know if you have anything else to add on the, uh, the, the, the issue of lessons learned uh, that would inform action plans at the regional and continental levels. So please go ahead briefly, because I really want to listen to, to Romy also and allow space for, for dialogue. Thanks, please. No, thanks, Idris. Um, you've already mentioned one factor and or one lesson rather, which has to do with um, multidisciplinarity, you know, whereby when we are trying to come up with a framework or an action plan, we do not just rely on one piece of knowledge or maybe just the security aspect of things. We also have to draw on the historical aspect, those who have the knowledge that can actually, you know, um, look at what these groups are using in terms of ideology. So I'll, I'll, I'll just speak briefly on that. Um, now, something which I think is very key is that um, when we look at some of these countries, not only Nigeria, we actually see that they have existing national action plans. For instance, Nigeria has, since 2017, there was a policy framework and national action plan for countering extremism. And we realized that when you look at the components of these action plans, they actually have a, a very comprehensive nature. In you have aspects that look at upholding the rule of law. You have a component looking at, for instance, strengthening intelligence coordination and so on and so forth. So it begs the question of, if there is an existing action plan in some of these countries, what really is the issue? So it has to do with sometimes with not only the political will, but also implementing, just actually implementing those components that exist exist and implementation with a sense of urgency realizing that what we're dealing with needs to be addressed as quickly as possible because of what is at stake so those action plans i think it's also about seeing how they can serve as models for even other countries and seeing how what can you know, what can be tailored to the realities of those countries and then i think the final thing and i'll stop here in terms of a lesson is going back to the idea of trying not to overlook communities. And there are four reasons why. Impact, experience, um, expectations, and responsibility. Communities are the ones experiencing the full impact of the crisis, whichever place you look at. They experience the worst of the worst in terms of the violence uh, that these groups perpetuate. And you need to, and there's something intrinsic about, you know, articulating, uh, you know, a problem when you experience the impact of it. The, the aspect with experience has to do with the fact that, that when we go to meet these communities, we need to consult them and ensure that the ideas are also reflected in what we bring as data and what we articulate into policy. When we speak of expectations, we can't just have policies that do not, again, consult communities. They must play a role in terms of this. And there must be some kind of monitoring and evaluation, uh, you know, sort of mechanism involved when we implement. And then finally, in terms of responsibility, uh, in regard to communities, not only do we have uh, you know, responsibility in terms of the policies we, we formulate, but also the kind of ethical responsibility as well. So when we publish, when we, we, we write about what is going on, when we talk about it, the visuals we use, the kind of ideas we use to represent the communities, 
in terms of ethics as well is very important. So I'll stop here and allow um, my colleague to, um, to speak more on this. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. The more we talk, the more we realize that communities are at the center of everything, basically. Uh, we should stop seeing them as victims, but as, uh, as actors in the process and also stakeholders. So they need to be consulted. They need to be, you know, even the solutions themselves, I think we can find them within the communities. So communities need to be involved from the outset, you know, from the inception of the strategy or the plan of action all the way through the, uh, the implementation. Rumi, finally, I do apologize. You know, I seem to be talking more than and more than the panelists. So let me just hand, you know, ask you a couple of questions before I had, you know, uh, give the microphone back to the audience. Uh, how have some localities affected by violent extremism in Kenya proven to be more resilient than others? We're still talking about this issue of resilience. What are the factors that have enabled such resilience to the threat of terrorism and violent extremism? Um, thank you, Idris, um, and it's my pleasure to be here today. Um, I think in terms of, um, of the communities, the first thing to note is that um, community resilience is dynamic. Um, there's no absolute resilience, um, but rather there's a conflation of factors and actions um, that can limit vulnerability or enhance resilience in any community. So. The journey to developing resilience um, isn't also, it's not a, a linear, straight process. Um, resilience can even flow depending on any number of factors at that particular time. Um, and I think this means that we always need to be careful when assessing communities' innate vulnerability or resilience um, and attributing them or not with resilience. Um, because these characteristics can fluctuate and change relatively quickly considering um, the context on the ground. Um, having said that, uh, we did our research in Nairobi, Kwale, and Wajir counties in, in Kenya. And um, linking in with previous research around community resilience, um, there were four, there were five broad factors um, that contribute to um, building a community's resilience to violent extremism. Um, the first of these um, factors is something that we call bonding capital, or basically it's, it's one's um, identity with one's own cultural and religious um, identity group. So feeling a sense of connectedness and importantly, inclusion within one's own identity group, whether that be cultural or religious or, or ethnic. Um, and we often find that a common complaint within identity groups is that there is an exclusion of certain members of, um, from important forums where things are discussed and decisions are made. So particularly women and the youth often tend to be excluded within identity groups when, when they're making decisions and discussing issues. Um, so one important element of resilience is widening community discussions from the involvement of just adult men or, or male leaders and giving a voice to the youth and women in community decision making. Um, so for instance, in Kwali County, we found that women reported engaging in peace um, committee meetings where they were actually, they actively contributed to peace and security discussions. Um, and also in Kwali, some mosques made a deliberate effort to engage their um, vulnerable or at-risk um, youth through Quran readings, uh, reading competitions, and school outreach visits to, to include those members of the, of the identity groups that are sometimes left at the margins. The second factor is what we call bridging capital, and this is around social connections and relationships and act active engagement across different identity groups, so across cultural, ethnic, or religious groups. Um, and here we have things like in Nairobi, respondents spoke about the cosmopolitan nature of the city, it's a bit of a melting pot, which means there are a lot more opportunities for interaction across different ethnicities and nationalities and religions. And therefore, the opportunities to foster an understanding and tolerance of other people's cultures and religions um, are, 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 more, are more bountiful. Um, Respondents from Wajir also told us that the town, they said that the town is full of non-locals. Um, and this makes residents more comfortable with doing business and starting to socialize with other identity groups. And again, fostering an understanding of where other people are coming from. Um, and these levels of, of trust between different identity groups, specifically between religious um, groups, um, they increase if the different groups have had some sort of working relationship or collaboration with each other. Um, so, for instance, 
In Nairobi, residents spoke about organizing public participation forums, um, which are spaces where people from all different identity groups meet to discuss and draft memorandums about issues related to service delivery, um, to roads, um, how markets are, are constituted, uh, and uh, other examples like that. Um, women in Nairobi spoke about integrating cross identity groups in an attempt to form savings groups. Um, so to share development ideas and to borrow money to invest in their own small businesses. Um, in Wajir, community members have established local and inter-clan networks of civil engagement. Um, to, and they've also organized protests. They've come together to organize protests against issues like police brutality. Um, the third factor, which is another crucial one, of course, um, speaks to what we call linking capital, which is the respect, trust, and confidence in communication between community members, local communities, and um, authorities. So whether that's um, law enforcement, government officials, community leaders. So that's a very important element. Um, and here, things are, I think, a little bit more challenging. Um, in Nairobi, respondents did report uh, meetings between the youth and the police, um, and these definitely have the potential to be positive. The youth felt that they were more empowered to ask questions and demand answers from law enforcement. They did say, they did give a caveat that their um, concerns were not always addressed, um, but there were certainly, that sort of engagement is starting to happen. Um, and they did say there were instances where the police provided the help that was needed in particular instances. Um, in Wajir, there were also forums in which the police engaged the community and where all different identity groups are, are represented and that suggestions from the community are brought on board. Um, and then fourthly, and these were issues we didn't um, go into great detail in the, in the research, but they, and they're much sort of broader. Um, but the fourth factor is um, a community needs, there needs to be socioeconomic well-being and development within communities um, to, to build resilience. And this includes the quality of education and particularly, importantly, religious education. Um, because the quality of education plays an important role in strengthening critical thinking around extremist narratives um, and building resilience. Um, and the last factor of, of issues that, that help to build resilience in, in communities is um, around violence related behaviors and beliefs. So this is the balance between those in the community who accept and normalize violence as a way of dealing with conflict. Um, and those who are willing to challenge and speak out against the use of violence as a, as a means of, of resolving conflict. So while these factors might not explicitly um, relate to violent extremism, they are the building blocks that allow communities to develop resilience um, and withstand the narratives that violent extremists bring into the community to articulate um, in order to recruit new members. This is, this is great, this is great. So Rumi, if I, if I may pose an, or ask another follow-up question. In your co-authored paper on preventing violent extremism in Nairobi, Wajir, and Kuali counties in, in Kenya, you know, there was this issue of dialogue, you know, the importance of dialogue. So can you highlight the role of dialogue in resolving local conflicts uh, that might otherwise lead to radicalization? Can you discuss the conditions conducive to dialogue between and within these communities, as well as between communities and security and justice actors to address problems that might otherwise uh, obviously leads to uh, VE or violent extremism. Yes, yeah, sure. So again, and um, interestingly, the, conducive, the conditions conducive to, to dialogue are in many ways very interconnected with the factors that foster resilience in communities. So again, both resilience and dialogues, they're not, they're not one-off events that happen or destinations to get to, but they are a process that, that takes time and, and needs consistent effort from everybody involved. Um, it's also interesting to note that meaningful dialogue is not possible in the long run uh, in a context where hu basic human rights and socioeconomic vulnerabilities are not addressed. So dialogue needs to happen, um, you know, as part of the building blocks of a more sort of socially cohesive and, and healthy community. Um, so within communities, dialogue, beca dialogue becomes an option between different groups where, first of all, there's an element of trust, or at least an openness to the possibility of trust between people from diverse ethnic and religious backgrounds. Um, and at an even more fundamental level, there needs to be trust between community le leaders and the leaders, the elders who represent them and who um, facilitate these discussions within the communities. Um, another important element here is an inclusion. 
um, as I said earlier, opportunities for dialogue in communities often tend to exclude certain groups. Um, so the voices of the youth and the women are often sidelined. Um, an interesting um, example here was that young men in Nairobi that we spoke to reported a high level of trust in their mothers. Um, and they were just said that they are repeatedly surprised that women on, are, are really included in conversations about countering violent extremism because they trust their mothers. Their mothers have important insights into what they are going through as the youth um, and they, their insights should be included in, in conversations about security and violent extremism. Um, then between communities and law enforcement, um, dialogue becomes a possibility when first of all, there's an improved treatment of the community leaders and um, community members by law enforcement. So there needs to be a reduction in harassment and profiling, um, which in, in turn would increase levels of trust between community members at ground level and, and, and law enforcement. There also be, needs to be an increased interaction between the, the, the police and the community members in safe spaces um, where community members feel that they can air their grievances and where they will be heard. So these can be established and facilitated by um, NGOs, which is a neutral party and are trusted by both the community members and the law enforcement to bring these two parties together to start talking about issues. Um, and then interestingly, we found that there needs to be some consistency and stability in terms of the law enforcement officers who are working at the community level, um, because members of the community told us that the frequent transfer of officers who, who have begun the dialogue process, who are cooperating in the process, if they transfer it out and new members come in, it kind of gives the impression that the police are not invested in working together with the community. So sort of a stable um, presence of the same officers who are willing to get involved and see the process through, through was important. Um, and then between the community and, and the justice sector, um, we found that there needs to be some basis for confidence in the criminal justice sector. So um, that, that the criminal justice sector will dispense justice and that it will dispense justice in a timely manner, importantly. Um, and also that there's no special treatment for certain groups within the population, such as political elites. Um, there also need to be platforms to, uh, that allow for and foster dialogue between um, community mem members and justice actors. Often justice actors are sitting in courtrooms um, and they feel quite removed from, from wh what's actually happening on the ground with the community. So community members need to be given the space to engage with justice actors. Mm -hmm. um, and an, an important element, uh, again, goes to that, that community members want to see that there is justice for the harm caused by law enforcement if that is happening in their, in their communities. And and that will um, bolster trust in, in justice actors and allow that sort of dialogue to, to start. Thank you, thank you. If I had to you know, summarize it, you would need to have representation or representation where you know, communities being represented in this dialogue or have some you know, credible voices that could be added to the dialogue. Inclusiveness, trust, and confidence are key uh, words, I think, in, 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 in terms of dialogue uh, or engagement in dialogue. Then my final question, and I beg you to be brief so I can allow the, uh, you know, the participants to, uh, to ask questions. Can you highlight other innovative programs that state and non-state actors have taken to prevent, counter, um, prevent violent extremism in Kenya beyond what uh, you have presented? Thank you, Rumi. Sure. So I'll try and be brief. And I think to do this, I'm just going to focus on the non-state actors, because I think we, we all pretty familiar with, with what's going on at a state level in Kenya around violent extremism. So um, at a non-state level, uh, there's some very interesting um, different initiatives. So for instance, um, there are quite a few organizations that are trying to work intra and inter-religiously. So try and um, foster this social cohesion and um, cultural and religious connectedness within communities. So for instance, the Kuali Muslim Development Initiative um, focuses on inclusion by empowering specifically Muslim women's participation in peace, peace initiatives. They also reach out to the youth um, with counter extremism narratives through social media platforms specifically to engage sort of digitally savvy youth. Um, then the Coast Interfaith Council of Clerics draws on its membership from, they have Islamic, Christian, Hindu, and African traditional faiths, faith, and they focus on building cohesion um, by holding intra and interfaith dialogue in diverse communities in Kenya. Um, and they also collaborate with the Kuali Women of Faith organization to organize meetings that include women. Um, 
Again, the Kenya Community Support Center, which focuses on social co cohesion, the building blocks of community resilience by promoting communication and, and engagement, again, between different identity groups, which is so important in building this cohesion. Um, and it also talks to the youth, um, youth discussion forums, as well as trying to build dialogue between the police and the, and, and the community through outreach events to improve that relationship between the youth and law enforcement. Um, and then I just want to point to one more, uh, which I found a very interesting angle, is um, an organization called the Foundation for Dialogue. And they um, aim to equip youth initi initiates by uh, who are undergoing their rite of passage with skills to identify, prevent, and counter uh, radicalization and violent extremists. So, so they work through rite of passage centers throughout Kenya. Um, and through this, they've actually reached over 2,000 initiates and indirectly those, those initiates, parents and guardians and relatives. Um, and the campaign has highlighted the potential of, of new and innovative spaces for, for reaching youth. So in this instance, through rites of passage, um, counseling as a tool for instilling values of peace and, and social cohesion. Um, so I think just my, my last point is, my last comment is just to say that building resilience, building community resilience um, entails a little bit of a, a shift in, in, in thinking and a, a policy shift away from looking at um, preventing and encountering violent extremism specific interventions. So that, that's your only angle, that's your only um, sort of focus. Um, to looking more widely at countering violent extremism relevant interventions. So instead of looking directly at CVE, we're looking at measures designed to reduce vulnerability to, to extremism. So they work on a range of factors, including socioeconomic, political governance, security, education, to, to, to build the blocks that will um, enhance community resilience rather than looking at specifically um, violent extremism um, prevention. This is, this is great. What's quite interesting about the three examples is that we have, you know, from Mauritania, which is almost state-centric approach to Kenya, which is basically civil society-led approach, even though, you know, the strategy is well drafted by the NCTC, uh, you know, it's funded by the government or portions of it. But in terms of implementation, there is a huge reliance on civil society organizations, uh, which is quite useful. And I think, you know, other member states that are thinking about putting these programs into practice have got, you know, the example of Kenya, you know, how civil society can be valuable or add value to the work uh, that, that you're doing. Uh, I, I thank the three panelists, brilliant presentations. I wish we had more time to allow you more space to, to share with us. Uh, I think you're only with our appetite. And, um, you know, I try to, to quench the thirst of, of participants that have been very active in the chat box uh, by picking on three, three, three or four questions. Uh, we have, uh, a question from Samson A. Yekosi from Nigeria um, asking what special peace building initiatives could be recommended in the context of reintegration and resetting persons involved in violent extremism uh, action uh, visa. The need to bring in perpetrators of violent extremists to justice, especially in post-conflict era. So um, I, I will look at uh, my colleague uh, Akinola. I, I seem to be picking on you a lot today, but it's the Nigerian case. So <laughs> you're the best position to, to give us some answers. So please, if you can give us briefly, you know, within two minutes, um, uh, you know, your, your response or reaction to that question. Well, thank you, Idris. Um, the question touched on two things. One, he, he talked about the idea of transitional justice, in a sense. He also talked about the reintegration aspect of this whole, uh, this whole situation. Now, these are very important um, aspects, and I thank the, uh, you know, the person who asked this question. Now, when we speak about um, transitional justice, I think it's a very important components, especially when we think about what will follow when the crisis uh, sort of uh, transitions into you know, a post-conflict phase. Um, it will happen in stages. I think um, there is a lot of reflection still going on on how this, you know, the kind of shape this will take. Um, but then at the same time, we, we have research already taking place. Um, even the Institute for Security Studies, where I, I work with colleagues who are also focusing on this, there is actually a project that is specifically 
looking at this idea of transitional justice in uh, the Lake Chad Basin countries. So I think it's one which will still unfold as we um, sort of uh, move along with the trends, but one which we should not forget because there are actually people who are victims of uh, you know, the attacks and what has happened over the dec past decade. And um, I think it's important that uh, in trying to shape or design a transitional justice uh, framework, they should also be consulted. And that is why even in our research, we are consulting and working with communities. We are working with civil society organizations across the four countries. Um, the other points about um, the reintegration aspect, it's also one which is very topical. In the last few years, we've seen a lot of debates. Um, people who have an understanding that um, bringing back former violent extremists or Boko Haram members into communities is the wrong way to go. And there are those who also come up with the view that um, it is part of what should happen, reintegrating them, and that some of them who joined these groups in the first place did not do it voluntarily. So it's a very complex uh, situation. And I think it's one which we also look at on a case by case basis. We shouldn't have this perspective where we say that every single person who uh, was associated with the group, uh, you know, was led to the group through a particular pathway. There were different recruitment strategies and even cases where Boko Haram actually abducted people and conscripted them uh, into, into the group's, uh, you know, faction, depending on the faction that, that we're talking about here. So, but it's one which I think will still require consultation with communities so that we avoid a situation, what, I mean, like what we've seen in the last one, two years where communities are rejecting those who are being reintegrated or cases where people who are rehabilitated eventually uh, rejoin the group. And, and there are a few cases we're actually noticing in recent, actually recent months, uh, one, two, three cases where some people seem to be rejoining the group and getting involved in, 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 in security, in, in armed banditry in, across the Northern region of the country. So I'll, I'll stop here with that point. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just jump to, uh, to Anwar. A few questions have been asked about Mauritania. Uh, I do apologize. I have to pick and choose quickly, you know, blindly. Uh, Anwar, I, I'll pick on my, one of our analysts at Kyert. He's asking the question, to what extent can the Mauritanian model, uh, because we're looking at a model basically that you presented, in countering violent extremists be em um, emulated? Uh, or replicated, knowing that some key analysts tend to believe that the Mauritanian methods are not necessarily reproductive uh, or re no, pre to reproducible and cannot be uh, reliable in other contexts. So that issue of context specific, uh, how, how does it play with the Ma Mauritanian approach, which we, as you presented was a holistic approach from the non-pact to aggression, non-pact to the other programs uh, that they put in place. So over to you, Anwar. Sure, Idris. That's, a, that's an excellent question. Obviously, you know, context uh, uh, matters. I mean, each country has its own uh, specificity. Uh, the level of threat obviously differs. Uh, so that that's all a, a fair a fair point. So it's very difficult to adapt to what the Mauritanians did. Uh, you know, in other in, in other contexts, given the local dynamics uh, and the context of other countries. Nonetheless, you know, what's the the important lessons is that. Uh, you, you know, political will matters here, right? Uh, so that that's critical. I mean, you need to 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 uh, to have determination to to tackle the threat. Two is that multi-dimensional approach, right? That that combines the preventive and the repressive uh, uh, measures here. Because the Mauritanians, what they did is that they took account, you know, into the factors that directly or indirectly fuel terrorism and and and, and violent extremism. Uh, you know, so. so so, so this approach, which combines an enhanced military and, and security response with a political and development approach, uh, uh, have contributed to a respite. To the, the the Mauritanian response is also based on ideological approach, you know, aimed at highlighting the country's you know traditional tolerance, trying to reconcile citizens with the religion, trying to discredit terrorists in the eyes of the population. Uh, you, you know, so so all of this. Can can is, is is critical here. Can be not necessarily replicated, but the bottom line is that you need a multi-dimensional approach to to tackling uh, 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 terrorism, whether it's through dialogue, whether it's through like the Mauritanians did the promotion of the 
you know, they, they recruited these hundreds of students from Quranic schools into the public sector, whether it's the creation of these new cities, or the provision of, uh, or at least efforts, right? Because the perception matter is that to, to see that the state is trying to, to improve uh, the delivery of basic social services in these remote areas, whether it's water, electricity, schools, health centers, roads, connection to the mobile telephone network. So, you know, it's, it's a long way to go, but, but again, it's, it's, it's political will uh, is, is, is critical. I mean, without that, you know, fragile, this fragile uh, paradigm is not, is not salvageable. So I think I'll, I'll stop here. Since we're thank you, thank crunched. you. Yeah, thank you, Anwar. It's, so it's important. It's context specific, but other examples that have proven to be positive in countries could aspire, uh, inspire uh, others to implement. And as Anwar is saying, you know, um, one has to do an, an internal assessment of the factors and, and vulnerabilities, but also the strength uh, of the existing mechanisms and so on. Um, uh, let me ask a question to Rumi. Uh, what is the most uh, and terrific barrier, I'm just reading as the question was posed, uh, that can help to stop terrorism and violent extremism in a country which is still peaceful right now. So this is from your Kenyan uh, experience, uh, you know, having had to evaluate and assess the different programs. Um, what can be done uh, from the perspective of a country that has not yet suffered, uh, thank God, you know, such incidents or proliferation of violent extremism. What can be done from that aspect and be taken from the experience, uh, Kenyan experience? Over to you, Romy. Thanks, um, Idris. I, I think, um, you know, what, what community resilience is all about um, in its bottom line is, is, is building a healthy, a healthy society, a healthy community. So as I said, it's not, not necessarily about specifically about countering violent extremism, but about building a, a community that is healthy and strong. And, and these um, issues can be, can be built upon um, as I like to look at it as kind of building blocks and, and putting together a, a 3D puzzle almost. Um, so we have uh, development issues, socioeconomic health, or the education um, governance. And I think it's an ongoing process, an ongoing project that if we, if we continue to build those elements into this project, the stronger the sort of wall becomes um, um, against violent extremism, the, the stronger the resilience of a community is. Um, so I think, you know, it's about, um, it's about, you know, this has often been said, it's about having a top-down approach, but a, um, complemented by a, a bottom-up approach. So the, the communities themselves need to continue this process of building resilience because, Obviously, we know how quickly the dynamics of violent extremism change. Um, we had violent extremism in West Africa and, and East Africa, and we've now seen it in, in the north of Mozambique. So, you know, it doesn't mean that any country is, is immune to, to violent extremism, and, and countries always have to be um, alert to this fact. Um, but the more that we can build the resilience of communities um, in terms of these kind of basic building blocks, um, the more that if, if violent extremism ever does come um, into that, the, the communities themselves will be able to, um, in some way, have the strength to, to um, repel them or at least be resilient against some of them. So I think um, sort of it's, it's those fundamental building blocks of socioeconomic health, good education, um, transparent governance that needs to be strengthened all the time within a country that hasn't yet experienced any of these attacks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just ask one question. It's actually two questions. I combine them into one and then, uh, you know, give it over to Anwar to, to answer it because the question is on Mauritania. Uh, it seems to have captured a lot of attention. Um, I understand. Uh, so the question is, they understand that uh, improve, this is from Van uh, Vijk from South Africa. Uh, CVE community police alumni. So this was one of our alumni uh, from uh, last year's program. And I have to say that many of the questions that you were not, uh, maybe were not able to answer uh, are questions that we have addressed and we'll be addressing in our CVE community policing program that we jointly organized with, uh, with, uh, with ACSS. So this is a good platform also uh, that will provide a lot of insight and information and answers to some of the questions that um, have been asked. So uh, are all the alumni is asking, I understand that the improvement of the brand of the state through service delivery was key in the Mauritanian concept for countering violent extremism or terrorism. Uh, how did they change their mindset 
Um, and then the other complete question or to complement it is they're saying that uh, it would be interesting to hear from the Mauritanian government uh, that has considered the willingness to suspend or deny assistance to nomadic rural communities for non-compliance or non-cooperation. Uh, as uh, are they uh, as willing to revoke the public service as they do uh, to uh, you know to to the extent of winning hearts and minds so it's the carroted stick here and the question is are they willing and will they you know resort to that to ensure that the communities are indeed complying um, and willing to comply go ahead um, over to you Anwar I mean, sure. Again, I, you know, I, I talked about the the, the importance of of, uh, of of political will here, and and what triggered that is to be to be brief, and, and I wrote a case study on it. Is that you know the the the, the, the terrorist attacks that that the Mauritania was uh, was was subjected to, and and some were obviously, I mean, they they, they were shocking than, than others. You know, several military services at at the, at the time. I mean, they were. They were killed. Uh, some were were hanged, et cetera, et cetera. So, so political political will here was was critical. I mean, by by the previous uh, by the previous regime. So, I think that's what what distinguished you know the the Mauritanian case uh, uh, from from others. Now, the challenge is how do you sustain that? That's the key. Uh, uh, the good news is that Razwani, the president, obviously is the architect of this strategy because I see in the chat one of that question. It's not just. Uh, uh, the previous uh, the previous president, but but more needs to be done now. How do you do you sustain do you sustain this? More uh, work needs to be to be done. There are still communities that feel uh, you know disenfranchised in 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 Mauritania, as 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 we all know, and experience suggests that frustration and strong anti-system feelings are the two primary denominators that drive you know political radicalization or religious radicalization here so more efforts needs needs to be done but the Mauritanian it's, it's both an approach uh, not cracking down on, on on nomads obviously because there are those that resist moving into the new cities that were that were established uh, 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 but 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 nonetheless I mean those that advocate violence or collaborate with with these uh, with these networks then there has to be a judicial uh, approach to that and i think I'll, I'll i'll stop it but the case study delves deeper into that unfortunately we don't have time oh okay. thank you very much anwar and i think in the, the 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 concept note i think there is reference to the case study so we'll invite if it's on the website we'll invite the participants to download it and have a look uh, look at the the case study which will provide a lot of insight and information um i i really apologize you know i just hated that we have an hour and and something and a few minutes to to go over such an important and fascinating subject and it's even difficult for a moderator to to cut short the the panelists and i do apologize i'll have to make it up to you somehow uh, and to the to the participants themselves we were not able to answer all the questions but i'm sure if you download the different documents that uh, were made reference to the papers uh, that were published by the P three panelists uh, i'm sure you will have a lot of answers uh, to some of these questions but i assure you that acss and kairth are working together to ensure that there is this continued dialogue and exchange that will happen through the series of webinars that we will be uh, jointly organizing. So we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that, you know, some of the questions that you have asked and uh, to which we could not, uh, you know, address will form part of, of uh, other webinars. Um, I think there are many takeaways. Uh, you know, I've been taking notes since the beginning. Many keywords that we have to remember, uh, the, the, the importance of dialogue community policing, community resilience, uh, the um, ensuring that whatever we have in place a process that there is the issues of state and non-state actors that have to be brought on board, the role of civil society organizations, the value or the added value that this brings, um, uh, representation, um, ensuring that communities are well represented, uh, you know, youth, women, religious leaders, and inclusiveness, and not to have, you know, portions of the community or uh, be excluded from any of these programs and then trust building and confidence between the community itself, but also with, with state actors. Uh, so many keywords, uh, you know, uh, that could be a subject of a, a, a full program. Uh, but I thank you all. Thank our dear panelists uh, for their valuable insight, uh, for her taking the time to share with us, uh, you know, this Thursday afternoon. 
uh, and, and also to guide us and enlighten us and, uh, and to share with us also the challenges that the countries are facing and provide some insight on, on some of the solutions that have proven to be successful. Uh, thank you for the panelists. We had a very good turnout uh, representation across the board. So this representation across the board from state to non-state actors is the one that we would wish to see in the development of national CT PCV programs, uh, strategies and plans of action. So as much as there is a will to participate in these events, there should be a, a similar will to contribute and to be a positive actor in the implementation of such program. Um, so I thank you all for your attention. And uh, Anwar, I hand over to you as you started this session. I, I, I rather give you the, the, the microphone to, to close this session down, but I thank you very much and look forward to seeing you soon. All the best, thank you. Something to add, pleasure, uh, Idris, again, always a, a pleasure to, uh, to, to work uh, with you, to partner with, uh, with, with Kai. So thank you to, the, to, to Rumi and Nola and all the participants, obviously, that, that joined us uh, uh, today. And, and there will be more of, of this discussion. Uh, so I expect that uh, uh, more to come. So, so thank you very much and uh, stay safe and well.